It's a week of disappointment, paralysis, and change. Our hometown's most impactful stories dissected next on Week in Review. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlee Scorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. Are you ready to pour through the news of the week with our bright-eyed and bushy-tailed news reviewers? From 41 Action News anchor and reporter Dia Wall is with us and getting up earlier than anyone should ever have to to deliver the news on Fox 4 anchor Mark Alford. From KCTV 5 News reporter Caroline Sweeney and political analyst, star columnist and editorial writer Dave Helling. Let's start with the freshest news. After nearly a year of public debate, Paseo Boulevard is no more. The City Council making it official. It will now henceforth be Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. I thought the issue was so deadlocked. No one could certainly agree on this issue after almost a year of debate. So why now, dear Wall? You know, for people who are disillusioned and maybe apathetic toward government, especially at the local level, this is a good example of what a small group of impassioned, mobilized people can do. I was one of the big doubters. I did not think they would get the Paseo. I thought there would be a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. street of some sort in Kansas City, but they made it happen. You said last week, Dave, they were hopelessly deadlocked on this. This was a shame as we were celebrating the 90th birthday, what would have been the 90th birthday of Dr. King, that they couldn't make this happen. Why this sudden change of heart? Be because the holiday, I think, reminded everyone of how embarrassing this situation was, and they decided one way or another we're going to hold a vote on uh, this measure. Now, Mayor James was out of town. I think that might have been helpful in terms of also breaking the log jam of consideration for this measure. But I do think just generally speaking, Nick, and we wrote an editorial about this that ran on the holiday Monday that sort of said this is an embarrassment to Kansas City. Make a decision one way or another and then let's move on. And but I do think that was What does this do, though, to actually make Dr. King's dream a reality? How are we moving the needle in any way, Mark Alford, well, I think it's moving, by making this decision to change the name of the it's street? It's moving us into a situation where other cities our size and large I, I went to school in Austin, Texas. One of the main streets down next to UT is Martin Luther King Boulevard. It's a thriving area, and I've said this before. There's no reason you can't have a Martin Luther King Boulevard on a prominent street, even though a lot of people are ticked off that the Paseo is not going to be anymore, a lot of historical people who are tied to that. My question is, I wonder how much of the vote was tied, though, to those running for mayor Yes, and... Uh, trying to court the urban vote. And by doing this and getting this done, uh, will they be able to say that this is a feather in the is cap? Is there a benefit to be made there? I saw that it was Quinton Lucas leading the charge for the name change. Scott Wagner also on the council and Alicia Kennedy both saying no. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement about this. People on the street themselves say they didn't even either know about it or didn't want the change. I think what we have to look now uh, at City Council is how we're doing moving the needle, kind of what Dave was saying. Things need to start getting done here on City Council. We have this and other bigger issues to deal with. I think people on the street were ready to see some kind of action, and eventually you just had to take a vote, and I think this was the day to do it. Can I just throw in quickly, Nick? I think in the, in the context of mayoral politics, it may be a bit of a wash because there are people who are concerned about this decision, particularly people who live on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard today who were not in favor of the name change. And so I think there are some people who are for it, some who are against it. Ultimately, when we get to April, I think it'll be kind of a neutral factor in the decision. And it's going process. to take up to six months before you start seeing all of those name changes take place in the city and the removal of the name Paseo. We can talk a lot about politics and big, meaty public policy questions on this program, but the biggest news of the week in Kansas City was a sad one. In fact, for many, it was like an unshakable hangover. The Chiefs' mm. path to the Super Bowl ends abruptly in a last-minute overtime loss to the Patriots. My youngest daughter asking this week, can we still have a parade since they got uh. this far? Is that not the way it works, Mark Alford? We should have a parade and make it in June. <laughs> <laughs> I and, and schools will be off, too, because that's what they wanted. Exactly. Okay. I would not want to be standing out this weather for a parade. 
Okay, now, Dia and Caroline, I'm interested in your stations. I mean, was there any sort of planning going on behind the scenes that somehow we may be having a Super Bowl parade? Well, I don't know about a parade, but I mean, when we start talking about big stories like this, we'd already done some planning. I know that we had started to credential um, reporters because the NFL is requesting credentials early. So we'd already started talking about, um, you know, p planning wise what we need to do. And because the company that owns Five, Meredith, has a station in Atlanta, um, we thought about you know, logistics that way, but I don't know about a parade. Was anybody, did yes. anybody say where it was actually going to take place if there were to be one? So the planning was underway for a parade, and this is normal, okay, because it is such a big production. Yeah. If you are even flirting with the idea of being in the Super Bowl, you do have to get some of those logistics planned and out of the way. Um, this was also confirmed by a council person I spoke to this past week. So, um, yes, we were planning, to Caroline's point, we had to get credentials out and everything else, but, yeah, there's a bit of a sadness hanging mm. over the city at the moment. And one of the big uh, storylines of the fact of this particular Chiefs game and the loss there was the fact that even though everybody watched the game, zero ratings for the PBS NewsHour on Sunday. <laughs> Can you believe it? Zero ratings. <laughs> Two Chiefs storylines that continue to play out this week. One, the firing of defensive coach Bob Sutton. The second, an NFL investigation into whether a Chiefs fan was using a laser pointer to throw Patriots quarterback Tom Brady off his game. But aren't lasers a prohibited security? Mm. So how did this actually happen? I, I'm not sure they know, but they need to find out because that yeah. it, it's, it's actually a fairly dangerous thing to be pointing those things around anywhere, let alone in a football stadium. Um, you know, the overall behavior of Chiefs fans uh, are is always an issue, Nick. Let's just be real about it in the stadium. I think sometimes, you know, we had a snowball incident in an earlier playoff game that concerned some people. Uh, so the Chiefs need to get to the bottom of how that device got in into the stadium and how it was used the but way it was. But you can't scan for that. I mean, they can stop guns and knives from coming in, but especially when it's cold and people are bundled up, how are you going to keep a laser out? They definitely need to go after this person and I think send an example and say this is not allowed. Well, the last time we heard from police, though, the chiefs at least had not filed a police report. So if they really need some investigative help, they need to get that ball rolling and get the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department involved to see if they can figure out what's happening. I thought one of the most interesting storylines was the hundreds of chiefs fans berating D. Ford for destroying their lives, questioning <laughs> how we can sleep at night for costing the chiefs the game. The only problem was they were tweeting the wrong person. The D. Ford they were attacking was the D. Ford, a 47-year-old woman in Kent, England, whose phone started lighting up with negative messages in the middle of the night. Is that a lesson on the perils of social media outrage? Dear Wall. It should be a lesson on look before you leap, okay? The bottom line is, this isn't the first time that this has happened to this poor woman in England, minding her own business, probably having a spot of tea. Mm. Um, but I do understand Chiefs fans being a little bit mad. That wasn't a little bit offsides, D. That was real offsides. So I do understand fans being upset and disappointed, but harassing people mm. is a little bit beyond the pale. As the federal shutdown now becomes the longest in history and with federal workers here and across the country complaining of financial hardship, we're still getting emails from viewers asking if federal employees aren't getting paid, why are our members of Congress? Kathleen writes, stop their pay and you'd see the government reopen real quick. Congressman Emmanuel Cleaver says this week he's refusing to give up his paycheck. As for new Kansas Congresswoman Sharice Davids, it's, let's just say, unclear. Yeah, I haven't made a commitment to not take my paycheck, um, partly because our first paycheck, why? Well, my first paycheck <laughs> won't be until February 1st. And if we're still dealing with this at that point, um, I, you know, I think that right now our biggest commitment is trying to make sure that everybody gets paid and gets back pay. Me taking my check has nothing to do with anything going on. It, it solves nothing. Uh, but the other part of the reason I wouldn't do it is because then I end up uh, hurting like everybody else, and then my anxiousness to get my, my check puts me in a bad spot to negotiate. Is that stance, though, hurting them when some of their local colleagues from Vicki Hartzler in Missouri and Steve Watkins in Kansas are not taking paychecks? You spoke with Sharice Davids this week. Not on this topic. We covered a wide range of topics on our show, but I did think it's wrong to kind of make this a political issue. I understand 
you want to show sympathy, empathy towards the workers who have been furloughed. But to say that a lawmaker can't have the money that they deserve to travel, to stay in Washington, Sharice Davids was already having financial trouble finding a place that was uh, livable in D.C. to go there and do her job. And now to tell her she's not going to get her, or make her guilt or shame her into not taking her paycheck so she can't get there and do her job, I don't think that's going to do anyone any good. Does this not sit well, though, with the public, Caroline? I don't think it's going to sit well with the public. When we see the statewide legislatures go over there a lot of time, a lot of lawmakers don't take a paycheck. But I do just want to say one thing. Vicki Hartzler and Steve Watkins might not be taking a paycheck, but Roy Blunt, Pat Roberts, and Josh Hawley are. So we need to remember that it's not everyone in Kansas and Missouri except Emanuel Cleaver and Sharice Davids. Right, and let's be clear, Vicki Hartzler takes or has taken hundreds of thousands of dollars in subsidies for her farm operations in her district. And Steve Watkins, of course, had his campaign bankrolled by his father, who has some means. Uh, Emmanuel Cleaver may or may not face some political problems for his decision, but your viewers should know, Emmanuel Cleaver is literally the poorest member of the House. His net worth is 435 on the list, primarily because of the debt he still owes or is responsible for on the car wash out in Grandview. And so it's almost impossible for him not to take the check and continue to live in Washington. And I think that was one of the reasons he didn't really talk about it in his no, news conference. That's true. I think it's a little bit of grandstanding. Let's just be perfectly honest about this. It makes no impact on their ability to negotiate. It has nothing to do with the issue at hand. There needs to be a solution when it comes to border security, whatever that looks like. These people have to be able to go to work, to Mark's point, and do their job because that's what we're paying them to do. And I don't think them not taking a paycheck helps either way to the left or the right. Another week in Kansas City and another storm that shuts down most schools around the metro, at least for a day. One of the pressing issues now is, what do I do with all those down tree limbs and branches scattered across my yard? While well, Kansas City, Missouri is often criticized for sluggish, slow removal, it may be a ahead of the curve on this one, offering free curbside pickup around the city. That's not true elsewhere. KCB TV viewer Celeste is irked why Overland Park isn't following Kansas City's lead and offering curbside pickup of limbs after such a damaging series of storms. Dear, you've been looking at that. Sometimes it's the basic things that make mm -hmm. members of the public angry. How come Kansas City can't do this and Overland Park oh, can do this and Overland Park can't? So we talked to the city of Overland Park. For them, it comes down to money. There was a big storm back in 2002. They said the city spent $4 million just on pickup. One of their arguments is that if you run your own trash service, as a city, it's a little bit easier, right? Because you just bundle it in. It's almost like if you have one kid in daycare, the second one you get a little bit of a break. It's a little bit different for the city of Overland Park because they don't run their own trash service. And so they did have two drop-off locations. We saw some people there who weren't upset. But a lot of people, I talked to an 84-year-old lady who was out there with the chainsaw taking down the limbs herself and had to call companies in. So that can be a bit of a hassle. I think the other point is, is that Kansas City, Missouri proper has more of a developed area with more mature trees and a lot bigger growth that's now falling due to age and so there's more of a need for that and Kansas City wisely has invested in the machinery grappling hooks that actually pick up the larger limbs that other municipalities can't afford to have. There are news reports this week that Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is now spearheading the effort to get Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to run for Pat Roberts' Senate seat in Kansas. Pompeo is a former congressman from Wichita. Why would, though, Pompeo give up one of the most powerful jobs in the nation to be one of 100 people in the United States Senate, Caroline? Well, I think it, it, there are a lot of different reasons here, but... Mike Pompeo has always had success in statewide elections when you're talking about um, how he plays in Kansas. Plus, this is a good play for his political life's longevity. If he wants to stay in the political eye and he wants to keep working for Kansans, this is a good step for him. Also, if he has political aspirations beyond Senate. You also got to add in there, they need him, right? The Senate has become one of the most tenuous places in Congress, and every vote counts, even within parties. There are now factions. If you look at the left, there's the extreme left, the extreme progressives, and then there are people who tend to want to stay more toward the middle. It's the same thing when it comes to the Despite a lot of the headlines on this, though, we see now that Mike Pompeo himself is slightly walking back, yes. closing the door slightly 
on this himself. Yeah, not slightly. Some Republicans think he, he slammed it pretty hard, but we're two years away from that election. That's a lifetime. That's several lifetimes in politics, so I wouldn't count Mike Pompeo out. I do think Republicans in Kansas will tell you that they're worried about Chris Kobach as a candidate and nominee because they think his campaign skills are not up to that race, and they think they saw evidence of that in the governor's race, and the last thing they want to do is lose what they think is a safe Senate seat. That's why there's pressure on Pompeo. But if he backs away firmly and completely, Nick, it will transfer to some other candidate, anybody but Kobach for some Republicans, and that's what's going on. Here. I was going to say exactly what Dave was going to say. We've talked for a long time about the depth of the Democratic bench coming uh, up in Kansas, but I think there is some concern that um, um, Chris Kobach could keep vying for these big seats, and we know that there um, are issues when he runs for statewide office. Real quickly, I think the person to look out for this, if Pompeo does bow out and says, I'm not running, is former Governor Jeff Collier. Which I saw this week is now gone back full time to being a plastic yes. surgeon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think he has a prospect of this, even though he failed to win the Republican well, If you look nomination. at why he lost, though, because of... Um, uh, the primary, you know, getting uh, primaried out by, by Kobach, mm -hmm. if that doesn't factor in now, Collier is in a strong position now to get the endorsement of Pat Robertson and uh, President Trump and those who were previously backing Kobach in that primary right. position. Unless, unless Kobach is in the race as well. Yeah. In which or case Susan we Weigel. The, the we have same. to remember she's thinking about and, the And Senate let's just too. be clear, Roger Marshall might run, Kevin Yoder might run, Derek Schmidt has been rumored as a candidate. I mean, we're, we're, so we all need to take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> I will we'll say, though, be. to Mark's point, I think people learn their lesson with the Kansas governor's race about Chris Kobach as a candidate in the state of Kansas. So I do think that improves people like Collier's chances. They want someone who can appeal to a wide range of people in the party. It's a story now making national news. An Army veteran from Missouri says he's been kicked out of his local gym for wearing a Trump T-shirt. Jake Tolbert says he was wearing his Trump 2016 tee to his workout when the gym owner informed him it was making other patrons uncomfortable as it represented racism. This happened in Troy, Missouri, which is between Columbia and St. Louis. It comes days after a Democratic congressman from Kentucky called for a ban on students wearing Make America Great Again caps after a highly publicized episode at the Lincoln Memorial over the weekend. But can a business remove you for wearing an item of clothing that they just feel is inappropriate? Yes, on a on, on private property, uh, business owners can make, within reason, uh, decisions based on disruption to that business. In this case, though, there's an argument that that speech is constitutionally protected. Uh, and, and just as a practical matter, Nick, it was not a smart thing to do. I mean, people wear shirts with, with varying messages all the time. There, this wasn't particularly obscene or profane. Uh, you know, m trying to ban Make America Great Again hats is just not a smart thing to do, even if it might be uh, protected uh, activity in some places. I'm really getting sick of this whole topic of uh, all the provocation that's going on in the U.S. You know, we all, always look at our rights, and yes, we have a lot of rights in America, and thank God we have those rights. What is our responsibility, though? If you think you're going to tick somebody off by doing that, why do it? Go to the gym, work out, that. get buff, and go home. That, that, in fact, I came close. I'm trying to figure out a way to put this in a column. But just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And, and one of the arguments in terms of the case in Washington, Nick, with the, with the uh, students from Covington High School and the Native American uh, confrontation is walk away. I mean, that's always an option. Walk away. Yeah. That's the polite thing to do, even if there is a right on both sides to make a statement. I agree. I mean, I think they summed it up just because you have the right doesn't mean you necessarily should, especially when there is some common opinion that it may incite certain feelings in other people. You 100% have the right to support whatever candidate you choose. You 100% have the right to wear whatever you choose. But in an environment like that, maybe a few people, close contact, it might not be the best idea. Now, what else might be offensive? How about posting a photo of yourself with your middle finger to the camera? How about if you're not the student doing it, but the superintendent? That's profanity. What he's doing is profanity. Lee Summit School Superintendent Dennis Carpenter under fire after a photo of him at a tailgate is made public on a Facebook page. Carpenter gives the camera the middle finger. Caroline Sweeney, this was a picture from a college game in November. Is there something more, though, to this 
uh, than is being revealed right here. I know there's been a lot of pressure on Dennis Carpenter, and even the teachers' union wants to see him gone from that district. Yeah, it's been an interesting school year so far in the Lee Summit School District when you're looking at um, the redistricting discussions they had earlier this year to the not one but two letters that the Lee Summit chapter of the Missouri NEA um, sent to the school board about the diversity training um, and how Dr. Carpenter is handling all of that. Um, but I, the man that I talked to, the man who publicized this photo, um, he said that he wants this to be a lesson in how everyone in the school district from the top down, administrators, teachers, and students, should all be kind of treated the same way and held to the same standard. Now, there were people on um, uh, Mr. White's Facebook page saying, look, he's an adult. Um, this is not a, a, a student um, kind of coming to, to Dr. Carpenter's defense. And this is not an old photo. This did happen um, in the fall, so it's not resurfacing, you know, Know, 10 years after the fact. But I, I know the Board of Education said they are going to talk about it. Unless I've missed a soundbite somewhere from Dr. Carpenter, the only thing he's basically said is it's unfortunate that it surfaced. I would like to see someone, any in this position, uh, no matter race or what school district you're in, if you're caught in something like that, say, I'm sorry, that was a stupid thing to do. I won't let it happen again. Let's all learn from this. And it reminds me of the Southeast Missouri State President. Uh, who was revealed on video back uh, in the fall chugging out of a beer bong at a game also, right. who apologizes he is still to this day the, the president of that university. From ending uh, daylight savings time to texting while driving, next we spotlight life under our state capitol domes. Let's start in Kansas where lawmakers approve a rule change allowing breastfeeding on the floor of the house. I'm assuming that's for legislators only. Plus a bill is introduced to end daylight savings time. It's one of the top items on the legislative agenda of the Wichita Chamber of Commerce. Is changing the clocks about to become a thing of the past in Kansas, Caroline? Well, it, it could be. There are actually actually some um, ramifications that I think people don't think of um, when you're just talking about whether or not we're going to turn back the clocks. Um, you know, Kansas City butts up against a different state who may not adopt the same time change uh, uh, regulations. But I do want to just talk quickly about the breastfeeding. Um, this is a rules change um, on the floor of the House of Representatives in Kansas. So, um, and please, anyone correct me if I'm misinterpreting this, but uh, female legislators who um, are breastfeeding can now stay on the floor because of that rule change. So um, I, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to, to do that, not as a, an elected official. But this, um, for a lot of women, working women in the state is monumental. You it's seem to by that. Okay. <laughs> that, that, is that is a so proud This is not just a symbolic uh, no. measure here. This I is mean, an important one. As someone who is recently retired, breastfeeding mom, working mom out here, I don't think people realize the stress and the pressure of that. I was covering President Trump visiting pumping and they're trying to the VFW is trying to get me a space to pump you know this is a real concern and as women become more prominent in the workplace and in the workforce as times continue to shift we need these accommodations so clap clap <laughs> yeah. but back to the whole issue of the, the day the changing of the clocks um, and certainly Caroline mentions what the issues may be Hawaii doesn't change neither does Arizona and Arizona has states butting up against them too right, but I don't think there's an overwhelming demand to do this Nick in part because of the problem on border cities it's not just Kansas City that would be a problem in Pittsburgh and Joplin yeah. and Wichita mm -hmm. and Tulsa, you know, Lincoln and the, and the northern border of Lincoln, Nebraska and the northern border of Kansas. So uh, I just don't, I, it's something interesting to talk about and there's sort of a libertarian thing about it, but I don't think it's likely. I will say this, let me just go back to the breastfeeding very quickly. It was part of a package of rules that the House passes every two years and the important things on the legislative process were not changed. You can still do gut and go. You can mm -hmm. still have uh, unrecorded committee votes. You can still have committee sponsors for legislation rather than individual legislators. We think that's a mistake. Yeah. The people of Kansas deserve to know what's going on in Topeka and the House missed an opportunity mm -hmm. to change that. Real quick on the ch time change. I'm concerned as a morning news anchor, what am I gonna tell people on Fox 4 in the morning? It's seven, six o'clock, it's seven o'clock, it's seven o'clock, it's six o'clock. 
What time is it, actually? I don't know. <laughs> That's practical. That's practical. Yeah. That's it's why you have all of those cluttered graphics at the bottom of the screen, <laughs> to let people know which nice state they're in. Third. In Missouri pick. this week, there's a bill to make the Chiefs the official pro football team of the state of Missouri and to outlaw texting and driving. The current law only applies to drivers under the age of 21. So Missouri is only one of three states that allows adults to text and drive. Is there a chance... That will change as a result of this session, Caroline. Well, you have two bills working together. You have one working in the House and one working in the Senate. So that shows that lawmakers in both chambers are very interested in changing this. This will also apply a $50 fine if you're caught texting and driving. And I just think people need to look at the overall number of fatalities on Missouri highways in the last two years. Both of them, uh, both years, unfortunately, have been close to 1,000 deaths, not all of them relating to um, you know, technology as a distraction, but there has to be something done to, to bring that down. But just because you have a law on the books, does it mean that behavior changes? I notice in Kansas, is, there's a $60 fine. They ban, ban right. it. A lot of people text and drive there. I was noting uh, in, in Kansas City, Missouri, um, even for people under the age of 21, there were zero citations um, issued last year for texting and driving. I think... Uh Police officers are hesitant to pull someone over just for texting and driving. That may change. It's a, a ancillary offense. If they catch you for speeding and then you're also texting, they may write you up for that. But I doubt it's going to be where they're actually just pulling you over for texting and driving. I have to say, before we complete our roundup of what's happening on both sides of the state line with our state legislators, I did see that there was an effort now to end this bi-state border battle. We have a new governor in Kansas, a relatively new mm. one in the state of Missouri with Mike Parson. Is this the end of companies moving from a two or three feet over the state line to take advantage of huge tax incentives? I, I do think that that activity is slowing down, but not necessarily because of anything that the legislatures and either state have done. It's just that the use of tax credits and incentives is under enormous uh, scrutiny mm -hmm. and pressure, and the states are broke. You know, the idea of giving huge tax breaks for a, a minimal number of jobs is not I as in favor as it was at one time in the states. And I also think, real quick, the propulsion of business and the excitement and synergy that's going on in Kansas City, Missouri, that's keeping some businesses uh, from actually moving across the state line. Yeah. It's hard to really push to give some of these businesses tax credits to come in, but you want to charge us a gas tax, you want to charge us 10% on groceries, you want to do all these different things to the constituents. So I think that that's where a lot of that scrutiny is coming into. Yep. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.